Greetings to you all and welcome. My name is Michael Spath and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, ICAD USA, and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. Co-sponsors for today's interview are Mondo Weiss, Kairos USA, United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, Friends of Sabeel North America, Disciples Palestine Israel Network, ICAD USA, United Methodists for Kairos Response, Menopin, Kairos West Michigan, Episcopal, Episcopal Peace Fellowship Palestine Israel Network, and Palestine Christian Alliance for Peace. Brian Brown is a South African born Methodist minister banned for 13 years by the apartheid regime until Nelson Mandela's 1990 release from jail. As one of the leaders of the Christian Institute in South Africa, he was involved in active opposition to apartheid, supported the black consciousness movement and called for civil disobedience and boycott divestment and sanctions to assist the end of apartheid. Brian and I uh, and others are in the process of discussing uh, a spring 2023 book tour. If you're interested, please put your name and email in the list and let me know that that's something you'd be interested in. And we'll, uh, we'll uh, keep that list for when we uh, confirm details of Brian's tour. So, Finally, Brian's book, Apartheid South Africa, Apartheid Israel, is available on Amazon in paperback and in Kindle format. And so I say that to you so that Brian uh, very humbly doesn't have to make a, uh, a commercial later on. Uh, it's in Amazon in paperback and in Kindle. So Brian, welcome. Your book is amazing, both in its scope and in its depth, Let, let's get right to it. Uh, let's start by identifying terms, uh, Brian. You distinguish between petty apartheid and grand apartheid, which you define as an ideology that intentionally pursues the total dispossession and domination of one ethnic group of people by another, implemented by means of violence and structures of institutional racism. Explain uh, the difference and why it's important to differentiate between uh, the two for those of us who are working for justice. A pleasure and a privilege to be with you, Michael and friends. I'm indebted to you for all you've done to make this possible. Grand apartheid was bad news for black people. Grand apartheid differed from petty apartheid, as it was called, in that it required of whites the violent dispossession of the 80% black population that comprised apartheid South Africa and incorporated in that action the dispossession of the black population of neighboring Namibia, Southwest Africa as was. The dispossession, the domination of blacks in South Africa and in Namibia meant that in terms of land, in terms of nationality, in terms of human rights, in terms of freedoms, they were dispossessed. Petty apartheid was essentially segregation. And whereas I would suggest that grand apartheid at the time was unique to South Africa in the totality of its racist domination and dispossession of the ethnic other, Segregation was prominent in many places and still is, and this audience 
would be conversant with that reality too. And so Nelson Mandela didn't spend 27 years in jail in order to sit on a park bench alongside a white when hitherto the park bench had been segregated for whites only. He did spend that time in seeking to end the dispossession and the domination of black people. So apartheid's definition as grand and or as petty is important because I don't believe that Israel practices petty apartheid in any distinctive way beyond that which other nations perpetrate. But I do see Israel practicing grand apartheid. You, you stated that, uh, uh, quote, as a young Methodist minister, it was within the church, I got my first understanding, not of what apartheid was, but as to what organized opposition to apartheid might be. And my opposition was expressed in church circles. Now, we're, we're going to get to your work with uh, Reverend Bayer's Nadia in a minute. But I want you to talk to us about this, this awakening as a young minister, this growing realization about the possibility of the church as a change agent in society. I came out of an evangelical background as a very young Christian. I don't speak disparagingly of that. And in some contexts, I wish to die um, evangelically inclined, certainly promoting the lordship of Jesus Christ. But in my young pilgrimage, I was privileged to engage in this body called the Christian Institute with an Afrikaner theologian and pastor church leader, Bayez Nadia, to whom Michael has made reference. And he sent me in the direction of not seeing the church and its institutionalization as the major commitment of my life, but rather the pursuance of the kingdom of God. And so from quite early on, I didn't like to call myself a Christian as much as call myself a follower of the way of Jesus. Because, well, if you do say you're a Christian, you've got this enormous baggage on your back. <laughs> and you have to carry all the iniquities of the past and um, defending, not the faith, but defending the church became rather tedious. But striving for the kingdom of God, the values of justice and of truth, that was exciting. And uh, I'm ever indebted to Bayer's Nodia, we might speak more of him in a moment if you so desire, um, for what transpired in my life. I was to be, not that I claim to attain to it, but I was to be a follower of the way of Jesus uh, getting all fussed up about kingdom values as the imperative of discipleship. And we're gonna, we want to talk about that more later on when we talk about the uh, Kairos Palestine document and Cry for Hope and how that is integrated with the way following the way of Jesus. Uh, but right now, uh, uh, I, want, I want you to talk about your Damas what I call your Damascus Road experience. Uh, that moment in 1972, uh, you were in the middle of an uh, anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa with the Christian Institute. And you took what you call, quote, a decidedly pro-Israel tour, unquote. You're in the old city of Jerusalem with your wife when a man on a balcony heard your South African accents and yelled, you're the ones who enslave and kill black people in South Africa, the same way Israelis kill us Palestinians. Say more about what this impact was uh, uh, for you and your ministry. 
Yes, say more about a, a significant event of over 50 years ago. Um, I was on a rather typical tour. I call it typical in that I aspired to walk in the footsteps of the master and I invited my congregation to uh, share with me in that pilgrimage or walk and off we went to Israel. All right, we might also be going to Israel, Palestine, but not a lot of people mentioned that fact at the time and I was um, not helping by my own appalling ignorance of the realities. 1970 was not long after 1967, and in 1967 so much had changed, and I was not familiar with either the event or the changes that had ensued in terms of the commencement of Israeli apartheid. And then, desperate to discover Jerusalem, um, this young upstart put the tour party to bed. Most of them were my age today. And uh, Marion and I dashed off through uh, the archway into a narrow alley. Some of you can perhaps visualize that kind of appearance. And we were rather selfishly talking aloud, uh, or very loud, and a voice from above um, shouted down to us, um, you are, as Michael has suggested, you are South Africans and you kill the black people the same way that the uh, Israelis kill us Palestinians. And really, uh, I was reminded of George Bernard Shaw's um, reference to Professor Higgins uh, with his distinctive ear for accent. And he rightly identified us as what we were, South Africans. Um, and I had to take the thought away with me um, and contemplate why in the middle of the night in uh, a place I came to call Palestine, um, I should be deemed to be a racist, but in association with the racism and the violence and the domination and dispossession exercised by Israel. So I had to rethink. I hope I did. And you went home and uh, tell us, uh, I mean, t tell us about then how that changed your activism back home. Yeah. I think it pointed to the necessity and Again, the Christian Institute was helpful to me in this discovery. The necessity of seeking to understand um, dis dispossession, seeking to understand persecution from the perspective of the oppressed. Now, some of you might say, well, um, he is talking the obvious, isn't he? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's not the smartest statement that we've heard today. But I'm sorry, I say the blatantly obvious because it's not in church circles generally. We so often, as happened in South Africa, derive our understanding of what is um, hurt of the other of what is oppression from the oppressor, because the oppressor, as was the case in South Africa, was white and powerful and Western. And after all, he was rather like us, the oppressor. And we like to have affinity with those who are like us, who think like us, who affirm us, who don't contradict us, who allow us to walk in comfort zones. And the church, of course, is very often a comfort zone. <laughs> you don't rock the boat, you don't offend with truth, you don't get angry even in righteousness, you're just smug and stum and silent. And so 
I was introduced to black consciousness. I was engaging with people called Steve Biko, whose name is probably known as one of the great martyrs of uh, black consciousness, and with people like Benny Corper and Barney Pachana. Um, and we were all very, very young. And on one level, it was difficult to sit at their feet because they were such young feet. But I suddenly found that I was being lifted out of my white liberalism mm. into a radicalism which was established in its norms and its pursuits and its requirements by the voice of the oppressed. And I had to learn how to listen. And in listening, I was enriched. And I moved, not adequately, but I moved at least partially into the pursuance of obedience to what I heard coming out of Black Hurt. So, so let's talk about let, let's talk about uh, the Christian Institute. Um, uh, it's one of the f was one of the few primarily white church organizations opposed to apartheid. You joined its staff in 1970 and remained until it was banned in 1977, and and you were banned too. So I have I have a few questions to ask you about your time there. You were the right hand man of its first director, uh, Reverend C. Dr. C. F. Bears Naudia, one of the heroes, really, in your book. Tell us about him and why his leadership was so important within the anti-apartheid movement. Bears Naudia was head of the uh, Dutch Reformed Church, the White Pro-Apartheid Church, which comprised mainly um, people of Afrikanerdom, white South Africans. Um, and he had his Damascus Road experience in a far more dramatic way than I, in that at a WCC, World Council of Churches conference um, in South Africa in the early 1960s, he was confronted with the truth that um, white Afrikanerdom was engaging in a state capture of the white Afrikaner church and making it beholden to its state bidding. And Bears felt that he was moving into a situation of faithlessness to Christ in order to sustain his faithfulness as head of the Dutch Reformed White Church. And so the response to his questioning of apartheid, I won't even call it a uh, refutation, but his early questioning of apartheid the response was vigorous and vicious, as was typical of the white regime. And the church was required by the state to suspend or dismiss Bayes Nodia unless their leader recanted and renounced the questioning of the legitimacy of God given apartheid. And Bayes did not comply with the state requirement. He listened to Jesus. And I would suggest that he too was as much the product of uh, his development as I in regard to black consciousness. It was Steve Biko and his comrades who suggested that we must stop talking, we whites, on their behalf, that they wish to, required 
the assertion of their own understanding, their own values, and the assertion of their dignity meant that we, in a way, had to walk into the wings and not be sent to stage, because the right to speak was theirs, but theirs in promoting black consciousness was, if you like, seen as black, because to be oppressed was to be black. <laughs> and if you found yourself getting oppressed in the cause of justice, perhaps you could be dignified by becoming an honorary black. And so Bayers moved into his wilderness, having been uh, defrocked. He physically took off his preacher's gown and put it on the, uh, the lectern and walked out of church, being told by his uh, now superiors that he couldn't teach in the Sunday school <laughs> because that would pervert and corrupt the young minds of the church in which he and his wife Yosa continued to worship. So, I mean, that is an extremity which um, I don't highlight with any pleasure, but pointed to the viciousness of dealing with him. And it just hints at the viciousness of dealing with those who weren't him, who were not black Afrikaner, who were not white Afrikaners, but who were black consciousness advocates. So I hope that it was that dimension which prevailed in the Christian Institute. And we found ourselves increasingly challenging the uh, what we called church theology in South Africa, which was silence, compliance before evil and being silent in terms of being able to sustain as the English speaking churches our engagement with the Afrikaner churches, but it was um, a false dialogue because the dialogue could only take place if oneself censored and promised not to talk apartheid. There may be shades and echoes yeah. of that replication somewhere else. Let's pursue that a little bit more. You've already given hints about this, Brian, but uh, tell us more about your experiences with Steve Biko and the Black Consciousness Movement, uh, uh, part A, and then part B, uh, how that might be instructive for us in our uh, intersectional solidarity between Black Lives Matter, Indigenous movements, and uh, Palestinian liberation activism in the U.S. Charlie. Um, Michael, friends, the black consciousness lesson that I happily learned early on was that it was so contrary to the image uh, portrayed in the white propaganda media. What was Steve Biko in my daily newspaper? He was a black upstart. He was anti-white, he was hate-filled towards us, he was inspired by communist come terrorist inclinations, and he would never be satisfied until every white, including those radical whites uh, who got alongside, until every white was driven into the sea, be it the Atlantic Ocean or the Indian Ocean, either would suffice. And so it was that in engaging with the likes of Petiana and of um, Steve, um, I had to move into this whole moment of demythologizing. Uh, why are you so nice? Why are you dare I say it, why are you so bright? That's a terrible thing I said, but that's the starting point from which I would have been coming as, as a white person. And 
So I realized that Steve was vigorously anti-apartheid, but he wasn't vigorously or in any way anti-white. All he said was that the liberal white establishment should stop getting in the way and believing that they could be the redeemer of blacks because their redemption was not the kind of redemption anyhow in its fullness and totality that blacks aspired to. And beyond the English speaking liberals, there were the Afrikaans speaking um, white Dutch form church people and political people, and they needed to repent. They needed to repent of their apartheid and give up on it. And significantly, Steve would often say, Mandela said the same thing virtually, that in engaging with the liberal English tradition, they felt more discomforted than in engaging with the hard line Afrikaner, because the hard line Afrikaner said, you're a Kaffir, you're rubbish, you're nothing, and I need to tell you. The English, like me, would say, um, it's terrible all that is happening to you. I, I am really very, very sorry. Um, I assure you, I pray daily. And the Steve Biko response, was to say it's so refreshing to hear people tell it like it is. And unless the dialogue is honest and partakes of integrity, I'd rather not have it. Reminiscent of uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, criticism and condemnation of white moderates in letter from a Birmingham jail and, and uh, others of his uh, sermons and writing. I, I know you're, uh, you want to talk about the issues, Brian, and you're real humble about this. But uh, as I mentioned, on October 17th, 1977, you were banned by the South African government when the Christian Institute was banned. You ignored the banning order about which you say, quote, so that I became, I think, the first person to be prosecuted for the crime of preaching in South Africa. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, yeah. and just say it again, so I've got to write the question. Uh, Tell us uh, about uh, this banning and your ban for preaching. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, banning was a typical instance of being denied a day in court of a state edict declaring that what you did was of terrorist nature, but what you did is known to us and the security apparatus and not to anybody else, and you cannot defend yourself in court, you can't have a day in court with a lawyer, and you will not be given the charges. And so the essence of banning in practical terms was that um, I could never be with more than one other person at a time. So if Marion and I um, met you, in the high street in Johannesburg, Michael, we would have to have a quick confab as to who deals with him. Um, you go to the lamppost over there, you have to be statutory paces away, and um, I will not be part of a, a crowd, and the crowd constituted three people. Now, as a preacher in South Africa, pastor of a Methodist church, <clears throat> even my congregations were bigger than three. <laughs> and so, um, could I go to church? Could I proclaim the riches of Christ? And the state said no. And so, 
I had to decide whether I would violate my banning by preaching. And again, that was an easy answer because good heavens, um, it is not for the state to determine, especially a secular, not a secular, but an apartheid state, sorry. It was not for them to determine my capacity to proclaim the riches of our Lord. And I don't want to appear too pious in this, uh, but I went to church and my congregation, bless them, were confronted with a very real dilemma. Because if we enter the church doors, we are into an illegal gathering and we too can be prosecuted. But when then I was singly prosecuted, bless them, they were whites in the large majority. Um, they gathered on the morning of my court case, early in the morning, because they had to get to work, most of them. And uh, I was assured they were praying for me. So we, we live in this strange world where the silent ones whom I earlier on in our engagement today condemned are not happy with their silence. Yeah. They are not happy with their insincerity and their inability to respond adequately to the demands of Christ. And they need to be given an opportunity. And I think so often in the church leadership, we deny them that right. So, yes, I was the first person to be uh, tried, and uh, then the conviction followed, but the case was dropped. Because suddenly, a Christian nation, as defined by the apartheid hierarchy, was taking a Christian minister, even if you put supposed in brackets behind it, uh, to court for the evil and heinous crime of saying Jesus loves you. And <laughs> even they discovered some inconsistency in uh, that statement. Thank you for that, Brian. That was an important question for me to ask you because I knew that you would give a give a, a, a testimony that was important for us to hear. In recent years, uh, both uh, Alan Bosak and Desmond Tutu have compared South African and Israeli apartheid, calling uh, Israeli apartheid worse, what you name uh, apartheid plus. We'll get to your comparisons in just a minute. Uh, we've hosted Alan Busak here in Fort Wayne. Uh, you worked, in fact, you were just on a webinar with him, I think you said last night. Um, uh, and you worked closely with Desmond Tutu. Our friend, Steve France, recently wrote a wonderful review of your book in Mondawais, in which he recounted one of your favorite stories. 1984, Mandela still in prison, Tutu leading an in-country civil resistance to South African apartheid. You were with him on a train journey to the UK. You remember that story? Yes, I, yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell us about that. And uh, tell us about that and what it teaches us, uh, because you talk about that too in the book. Yeah. Um, I recall the train journey very well. Um, I love to tell the story because I love name dropping <laughs> and it allows me to intrude Desmond, my friend, which is a phrase I love to use. But this dear man and I were traveling and he entered into a lament. I think the lament was, I hope the lament was bound up with an affinity we shared uh, as to the struggle. And he said, you know, Brian, um, I just get exhausted running around like a scalded cat. That's a real tutuism running around like a scolded cat, uh, seeking to say to white people, uh, I love you, won't you love me back? Uh, I need a lot of loving. Um, I need a, lot, need a lot of affirmation. And 
instead of engaging myself with a white community in excess, he didn't use the phrase, but he implied it, um, I should be engaging with the black community in their oppression. And I do feel deprived in that way. And I do just wish, he said, and then with that uh, delightful impish smile, I do wish you could tell your people that we blacks love them. And uh, that was Tutu. That was Tutu saying, I do not what I desire to do, even always what I need to do, but I do what is significant to bring Christians, white and of course black, on board in a united commitment to get rid of apartheid. But so often he was saying, I'm demonized. So often I am having attributed to me the ascriptions of communist violent terrorists. And of course, we must remember it was the time of the Cold War. And so apartheid had a card to play in terms of saying blacks like Tutu are really in the pockets of the Kremlin. And they use their clerical collar and attire in order to cover up their communism. And the demonizing of the other, the distortion of truth of the other was a constant in our South African struggle. And uh, that's why I tell the story. Yeah. You list, you list, uh, I mean, I, I'd love to just spend an hour just asking you to tell us about uh, Desmond Tutu stories, but I, I want to press on. Um, you list 37 specific forms of structural inequality imposed on Palestinians, Israel's uh, violations of human rights and international law. Um, Christian denominations in the United States now have begun using the word apartheid. The United Church of Christ, Disciples, uh, Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C., as well as these reports from Israeli uh, organizations and human rights organizations, Yesh Dean, B'Tselem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and just yesterday, Harvard Law School. Tell us why all these Israeli, Christian, international human rights groups why, why using the word apartheid is so important from the perspective of international law? Within international law, and I don't claim to be uh, an academic authority, but it's been part of my discipline to acquaint myself with uh, the essence or something of the essence of it. Within international law, as it pertains to apartheid, in the time of apartheid in 1973, the United Nations was engaging with the issue to state the obvious, and the apartheid declaration, as it is called in shorthand, which is all about the suppression of evil and um, the punishment of evil and apartheid is evil, that declaration suggested that the apartheid uh, dogma violates international law in terms of dot, 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 uh, how that apartheid uh, convention was written. So intruding into the consideration of apartheid as experienced in South Africa, was the international dimension that uh, we who take law seriously should 
warn the apartheid leaders that what they are doing is not just bad, as the church came to say, heresy, but is also a crime against humanity. You are doing that which is inhumane. You are doing that which has criminal intent. And then along came in 2002, the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court. And it was saying much the same thing that apartheid, when it is done with the intention of dispossession and domination, and these words are used, when that uh, Rome statute is violated by the perpetrators of apartheid, they too have moved into the realm of criminality of a crime against humanity. And they were both, the Rome Statute and the Apartheid Covenant, drawing from the resources of the Fourth Geneva Convention and especially uh, Article 49, um, in which regarding Namibia, um, the occupation of South Africa of the former German Southwest Africa um, was seen to be um, a crime against humanity. And of course, the article I referred to specifically saying that to have your troops or your civilians or your people from the neighboring state um, occupying that state in violation of international law um, was not on. Um, so suddenly this groundswell of international law, opinion and violation um, became, I sense, more evident to bodies like Bet Salem and uh, Yeshdin, the human rights uh, agencies, commendable ones in Israel, and uh, the more recent statements told yesterday Harvard, but going back recently, of course, the um, Amnesty International and the Human Rights Watch bodies, uh, they, I won't say belatedly, because that would be insulting, but they thankfully <laughs> dis discovered that this was really an issue up their streets. Yeah. They, of course, they didn't have to say um, that apartheid does this and does that. They could say that apartheid in the totality of its intention to dominate and dispossess uh, another people along ethnic lines and implement it by violent means, that that is a crime. And so international law, I feel, um, and human rights bodies have had this happy marriage. It is a marriage made in heaven, whereby they are providing the churches who, taking my line, are saying in comparative terms, Israel replicates South Africa's apartheid and say, yes, but not just in comparative terms, Brian, in analytical legal terms, Israeli apartheid replicates South Africa's apartheid. So there we have this convergence, if you like, of three forces of human rights, of international law, and of the church, when it does choose to speak the truth to power, and they're, they're saying the right thing. And may I say, as I shut up, uh, when I started off with the book, 
and sorry, this is a bit of a prom promotion, isn't it? All right, but I've started, I'll finish. When I started on the book, it was the commencement of lockdown and uh, here in, well, international. And um, I, I felt a rather lonely figure, a rather stupid wilderness voice. Um, and I tentatively called the book, this is confession time, Apartheid uh, South Africa, yeah, exclamation mark. Apartheid Israel, question mark, uh, read the book, consider if the verdict is exclamation mark, replacing question mark. And I don't do that anymore. And uh, some of you have told me in the States, I shouldn't have done it in the first place. That's right. Let's, uh, um, thank you for that, uh, Brian. Your book's touchstone really is the testimony of the Palestinian Christian community <laughs> from whom you liberally quote many of the characters who we would know in, in the US. But of course, the Kairos Palestine document from 2009 and especially the 2020 Cry for Hope, which both of which, right, have a, a rich, uh, um, basis in history uh, um, in the New Testament, throughout uh, the church, up through in the 20th century, Barman, the Cairo, South Africa document, 1985 and more. I want to ask you some question about the importance of these two Palestinian Christian documents. Palestinian Christians say in the cry for hope that the land has a universal mission. How do you understand that? I understand it as the land belongs to God. <laughs> and um, the land, as that which belongs to God, is a land which is blessed by God for humanity's usage and ideally stewardship. I believe that the land is not given in nationalistic chunks to diverse groups who call themselves nations. And I learned that lesson in South Africa because white Afrikanerdom said the land belongs to us the land of South Africa, because this is where we are and God has entered into a covenant with us and God has fought for us and bestowed the land to us. And we are the exceptionals, the entitled ones, the elected few, the ethnic superiors who own the land. And I might say, but come on, chaps, and they were all chaps in those days, um, are you not forgetting that uh, you came from a rather flat bit of Europe called Holland and immigrated here uh, and then decimated the indigenous population? Uh, doesn't God expect you to still be back in Holland or the Netherlands? Um, and that was a discomforting question. But there was this sense of the land being ours as an ethnic national white group for whom God had fought. And to, to quickly intrude this, because it's not generally known, perhaps, um, on the 16th of December every year, South Africa ceased to um, work and we had a national holiday called the Day of the Covenant, which commemorated the Battle of Blood River on the 16th of December, uh, 1838, when God fought for Israel and gave us whites the victory. So that was the, the ethos prevailing in those days. And to say that blacks had to commemorate the 16th of December 
the day of their being defeated by God as a pagan people was an expectation that we made of our fellow South Africans. Yeah. Such was the effrontery, the arrogance that we displayed towards the dispossessed. And so the land is God's and God bequeaths the land to his people, but God doesn't cut it up in ways whereby his people have their peace and ethnicity and exclusivity prevail in that piece of land. Whereas in the graciousness of God, all are welcome, all included, all to be stewards of my land. Which you uh, uh, call uh, also based in the cry for hope in the Palestine, uh, Kairos Palestine document, this idea of a covenant people of entitlement and exclusive identity, uh, which has led to all kinds of disastrous uh, foreign policy and domestic policy uh, uh, decisions, including manifest destiny, settler colonialism, and others. Uh, you know, this confluence, we, you and I were talking on Friday, right, that this confluence of nationalism and faith in South Africa, in Israel, in America, in Great Britain, in the UK, right, uh, and its dangerous consequences. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me keep going. Uh, I, I'm, I'm aware of the time here. I want to ask you some more. Like anti-apartheid activists in South Africa, Palestinian Christians, civil society in Palestine, Christian denominations here and others have issued a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, why for you, Brian, is BDS so important at this time? In South Africa, the Christian Institute in 1977 had to make a decision. It was a decision to be silent or suicidal. <laughs> um, the question of BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions had arisen internationally, and we need to make a response, albeit knowing that uh, this was to move into the realm of uh, terrorism and the Terrorism Act had consequences um, which were extreme. And um, we opted uh, to back BDS. Um, we didn't talk about mandatory sanctions, when do we want them now? But we did say targeted sanctions and targeted sanctions specifically or especially um, of the financial institutions, because an investment in South Africa, apartheid South Africa, was an investment in apartheid. I personally visited the uh, chairman of a body called Rio Tinto Zinc, which is international, and asked him uh, as to what he was doing with his Rossing mine in occupied Namibia in violation of international law in providing uranium for enrichment here and there. And he had an answer, um, but it wasn't, in my estimate, a particularly good one. And so that whole approach of saying BDS uh, must be pursued was bound up with various principles. One, obviously, it's nonviolence. Secondly, the fact that it gave dignity to the dispossessed. When black people in the African National Congress, Mandela's movement, called for BDS, as they did with uh, vigor, they were saying, this is something we can do. 
this is something that can be perhaps for us of a sacrificial nature. Because when there is economic disadvantage, black labor will be disadvantaged. But when whites around the world tell us they are against sanctions because you unfortunates over there in South Africa are going to suffer, their response was to say, hey, we're suffering, believe me. We'd like to suffer redemptively. We're tired of suffering punitively. Will you do something? And so when that call was forthcoming, this was for the Christian Institute and a few of us who were its, its executive, um, that was the last straw for the government. They were angry about the encouragement of black consciousness. They were very, very angry about BDS and banning followed. You end your book by discussing uh, status confessionis in the Reformation, Nazi Germany, South Africa, and Palestine. Uh, you begin uh, your book by talking about the 2020 cry for hope, where our Palestinian friends declare that, quote, this Kairos moment, the, the, at this Kairos moment, the, the very being of the church, the integrity of the Christian faith, and the credibility of the gospel is at stake. Tell us uh, why uh, you call, uh, among others, uh, for this uh, uh, status confessionis uh, uh, in the church's response to Palestine and Israel and why that lies at the heart of the gospel. Michael, friends, in my relationship with Bayez Nadir, who was very much my boss and my senior and could have been my father, in that relationship, um, I was privileged to have access to um, German thinkers who, uh, like Betka, the um, chronicler of the works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who visited us and told it like it is, as we agonized in the Christian Institute, whether we should become a confessing church community. It was a big debate. And uh, Bayer's was then feeding into the Christian Institute. The Bonhoeffer Insights, together with the likes of John de Gucci, one of our esteemed members, and Alan Bussock, of course. Uh, and we came to that point where we saw that just as the Barman Declaration had declared a status, or pointed to, sorry, pointed to a status confessing owners, whereby you couldn't be um, a member of the state church, which was in cahoots with Nazism and a follower of Jesus, we saw that that dimension of looking at the theological impotency of the Calvinism practice at that time by the white Afrikaner church and saying, yes, this is apartheid, this is a status confessionis, just as Bonhoeffer had said before Nazism, I cannot be a follower of Jesus and of Hitler. So we were saying, I cannot be a follower of Jesus and of the apartheid regime. And that discovery, if you like, was augmented by the likes of Alan Bursak, with whom I shared last night, as you said. And uh, we recalled together how in 1982, Alan, as a stripling of a leader, uh, went to Ottawa, Canada for the uh, meeting of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. And he said something that will always resonate with me, that, you know, we're all going to have the uh, Holy Communion, aren't we? Yeah. 
and uh, won't it be lovely to break bread together in the Lord? Uh, but just a reminder that when we go home, we black representatives of the Dutch Reformed Church will not be allowed in the precincts of a white Dutch Reformed Church, let alone partaking of bread and wine together. And, you know, I think that came as a shock to many representatives of this assembly of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. And Alan then said in his forthright way, here we have a status confessionis. And the church has ceased in white Dutch Reformed Church terms to be the church of Jesus Christ. It needs to be right. And so- Go ahead, he, you, you, you uh, froze there for a second. Go okay. ahead. Sorry, sorry, uh, am I alive again? Yes, you're back, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, and, and, and Alan was saying, um, if I got to kind of here, that um, the status confessionis uh, required the church to be, as we hear in Cry for Hope, a church faithful to the gospel, faithful to witness, faithful to the lordship of Jesus. And you're violating this. You should be suspended and you should certainly be ashamed. <laughs> And uh, so the suspension followed. And in South Africa, there was then this cumulative swell of the Lutherans coming in with um, Bishop Manus Putalezi saying, also in the 1970s, here the church is in a state of gospel faithlessness. And that is a very challenging thing. And when you take the gospel faithlessness dimension against Hitlerism and the gospel faithfulness in terms of opposing apartheid, and you come to Israel, Palestine today, many are beginning to say, well, this is also a status confessionis, isn't it? Yeah. Can you really back? Israeli apartheid and be a Christian. I would go further. Can you really back Christian Zionism and be a follower of Jesus Christ? I'm aware of the time. I've got two or three more questions. So uh, um, I'm gonna ask them and then uh, we'll get your replies and we'll keep moving. Really, the heart of your book, and it, it was just so instructive, Brian, was chapter nine, where you provide a detailed comparative approach between the racist policies, policies of South Africa and apartheid Israel. You, you, list these, you list these, what, nine different points of comparison. We talked about one, the confluence of nationalism and faith. Um, one of the other ones that I'd just like you to talk about um, it says they share in contributing to limitations on religious dialogue. Um, you know, we're going to be talking uh, next week with the United Church of Christ, you know, this the weaponization of anti-Semitism. You reference uh, two Marks, you know, Mark Ellis, was, he talks about the ecumenical or interfaith deal. And of course, our, our uh, 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 mutual friend, Mark Braverman, that's the subject of his book, you know, Fatal Embrace. Yes. How, talk about this, uh, uh, how they share in contributing to the limitations on religious dialogue and, and why that is so dangerous. I talk about, and I don't do it alone, um, an ecumenical contract um, or a religious pact, which is being played out. I speak for my British church society better than elsewhere, which is being played out in Britain today. And uh, many of you will be familiar with the understanding that in our interfaith dialogue, as we wish to define it, um, there will be two taboos. The first taboo will be the uh, accusation that Christians 
contributed to the Holocaust in significant ways. And that accusation is perfectly valid, and uh, I'm happy to hear it as an accusation to be repented of, and obviously not in other ways. And then the other taboo is that um, apartheid Israel will be mentioned, going a bit further back, uh, the occupation uh, by Israel uh, of the occupied territories of West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, um, that is the unmentionable. Now, let's come together in our holy huddle. Let's bless one another. Let's be nice to one another. Uh, let's uh, say a mild sorry uh, for the things we have done. And uh, we have in the back of our minds the things we can't mention we have done. And uh, let's talk about uh, supersessionism or something like that. A, a nice theological debate. Um, and so we pursue that. And I would suggest that that is a cop-out and it is a cop-out which we have devised in order to ensure our comfort uh, faith zones. And the end result is we don't speak the truth to one another let alone speak the truth to power, and we fail to acknowledge the elephant in the room. In South Africa, we had this ecumenical pact between the white pro-apartheid churches and the rest. And there, there was an elephant in the room, and it was called apartheid. But you couldn't speak that apartheid thing um, without breaking the rules. And I think it was last night I, I, I said, I remember being in such a gathering and I broke the rules. And the response from one of those aiding and abetting apartheid was, Brown, you talk about nothing else but the love of God. <laughs> and I said, is, is that to my detriment or to my praise? <laughs> I, 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 I need to know. Uh, are you really praising me? Uh, and, and, and so it was. I had broken uh, the, the boundaries or transgressed the boundaries of debate. And the occupation, of course, is the elephant with which we are confronted today. And may I say, finally, um, that when that debate is encouraged, some of the Christians in Europe, I just speak of the Christian leaders in Europe, um, decline to bring the Palestinian Christians into the room. <laughs> yeah. Because they come in with the elephant. And there's no room, is there, when the elephant is there? And so they are diminished and disappeared. And it's not just Palestine being disappeared or Palestinians, but the three Palestinian church leaders whose letter I saw last week, which said to the church in Europe designated, which was silent before apartheid, by the way, we are here. Pinch us, you'll see, we cry. Won't you speak to us? We have a word to say, albeit from the perspective of the oppressed. Let me just keep building on that with you, Brian. Um, in the book, you describe what you call the psychology of Christian denialism in apartheid societies, and, and especially among mainline churches in the West. Despite, you say, quote, decades of documentation by Palestinian Christians about their oppression under Israel's settler colonial project. One of its symptoms, you say, is not addressing facts, but rather relying on deflection, exceptionalism, feign ignorance, 
and ad hominem attacks. Say a word about the psychology of Christian di denialism and what can you what what advice can you offer uh, us in confronting that uh, phenomenon? What I've been trying to describe um, in terms of the room without the elephants being a prerequisite for interfaith debate is how Christian denialism uh, connives with the oppressor in terms of the reality of oppression. And so in South Africa, um, it sounds strange, but I, I, I hope I'm accurate. In South Africa, so many of us who were white would say, um, what loss of land, what loss of nationality, what loss of uh, human rights, what does it mean to talk about this uh, international law thing? What's the problem? They're in their small corner. I might be in a rather bigger one, but um, there isn't a problem. It is the sheer capacity to deny the reality of a situation. And that can only be sustained by exclusion and the attribution of entitlement. When, for instance, Bishop Manus Butelezi joined the Christian Institute, he would be part of our gatherings when he would say, I'm glad to be with you. And they were invariably, in this instance, a white gathering, because I have come tonight to help you to share the liberation with me. And he was calling into question the white assumption that really they were free, <laughs> that they were not enslaved by apartheid. And it is this denialism, not only that blacks were oppressed, but that we whites are oppressed, that we sought to engage with in the Christian Institute, and of course, many, many other um, circles of that nature. So denialism is not only the denialism of the right of others to be free, but is a denialism of my own unfreedom and the non-pursuance of my freedom. And Mandela, of course, was the master of this truth when he talked about the indivisibility of freedom. I need to be free for you white people to be free. And we are born to be free and we share the pursuit of its indivisibility. And he then personalized it by saying, not exactly these words, but truth to the sentiment being expressed, true to the sentiment, he said, uh, the Palestinian people and their freedom is essential for my freedom. In a way, Mandela died unfree because he died before Palestine's freedom. I have one more question, Brian, before I let you close. Uh, um, all the movements we've talked about today, the confessing, the confessing church uh, in Nazi Germany, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, uh, the Palestine liberation struggle. Uh, you're a Methodist minister. And so uh, from the Christian perspective, they were grounded in their understanding of the gospel of Jesus, what you call the followers of 
the way. So get, you've spent your life working against apartheid, against injustice for this liberation and freedom of those who are oppressed both in South Africa and now in Palestine. Tell us, give us your testimonial, you know, about why it has been, what, what has it been about following the way that has inspired you and challenged you uh, in, in your ministry? I, I think that there came a point in time when I sensed that so much of Christian presentation is about, yes, our getting saved, our conversion, our commitment to the way of Jesus. And it is as if then some static thing happens to ensure that there is no development from that point. It's as if the Holy Spirit, um, having moved me to this moment, uh, enters premature retirement um, <laughs> and I pursue my way. I like to think that the gospel is about our development. And I like to think that that is true because I see Jesus developing and I see his disciples developing. I see Jesus born into a very ethnic environment um, with all the associations that come with the pursuance of a distinctive uh, ethnicity as if it is the priority of life. And he begins to engage outside of his ethnic grouping, his tribal grouping, uh, and he makes discoveries with a Gentile woman um, uh, and about what the gospel is in terms of being uh, an expansive um, ethnicity or uh, an inclusive ethnicity. And he decides that he's on a journey and the journey is uh, ever inclusive, ever inclusive of the, and we know the story, of the poor, of the marginalized, of the Gentiles, of the Samaritans, of the outcasts, of the lepers, of all those what ain't very nice and certainly not us. And when he breaks the bondage of usness, he does so in conjunction with Peter and Paul. So this suddenly becomes a very formidable trinity of those who say, in my journey, I have moved from the tribal to the global, and the gospel is not ethnic exclusivity or entitlement, the gospel is for all, for all. And I think that that was a factor in my pilgrimage, and you ask about it, where I suddenly realized the constraints of my upbringing as a child in South Africa, where I was beholden to a tribalism and a tribal nationalism, which was so at variance with the pilgrimage of Jesus and his followers, Peter and Paul. And I wanted to share the journey, and not faithfully, but uh, spasmodically, um, I, I, I've got on the road. And suddenly life becomes so exciting, because you're into the pursuance of something which might be seen as tilting at windmills, but at least you know that ultimately they will be vindicated because ultimately God is God and God is good and God is just. And if I do have a final moment, I'd like to return to that. I'll let you do that. Uh... Because I, I do want to give you the last word, but before I do, I just want to remind uh, everyone that uh, uh, you'll be able to find this interview on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel next week. 
and Brian and our co-sponsors will also get that link from me. Also that we and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network have another interview scheduled for our next Wednesday, March 30th at 12 noon Eastern time with Jewish educator and activist Mark Weber on the topic, the weaponization of anti-Semitism. And just another reminder that we're in discussion with Brian about an upcoming book tour in the United States. And so if you're interested, please put your name and email uh, and that request in the chat room quickly while we close. Brian, man, uh, for, for uh, uh, you, when we first met, you said, well, I'm in my mid 80s, but you're pretty spry mid 80s. Uh, and uh, we love, we love your passion and your commitment to justice and your, your commitment uh, to Christ. Please share any parting words you might have for us. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, in my naturally self-effacing modern, <laughs> uh, I have not <laughs> yes, naturally. Not it's book. natural. It's naturally. Yeah. <laughs> and ordered not to by my host, and I'm an obedient person, as you know. <laughs> and so I thought, well, let me give the final fling to Desmond Tutu. After all, we've just celebrated his 90th birthday. We are in the process of celebrating his life and in the process of encouraging a legacy uh, that is unique. So this is what Desmond said about the policies towards Palestinians generally. My heart aches. I say, our memories are short. Have our Jewish sisters and brothers forgotten their humiliation? Have they forgotten the collective punishment, the home demolitions, their own history so soon? Have they turned their backs on their profound and noble religious traditions? Have they forgotten? that God cares deeply about the downtrodden. Israel will never get true security and safety through oppressing another people. We condemn the violence of suicide bombers. We condemn the corruption of young minds. But we also condemn the violence of military incursions in the occupied lands. He concludes, people are scared to say wrong is wrong because of the Jewish lobby. Injustice and oppression will never prevail. That lobby is powerful, very powerful. But those who are powerful have to remember the lit test that God gives the powerful. It is you are judged by your treatment of the poor, the hungry, and the voiceless. And there are, of course, many times when I feel, oh gosh, uh, I wish I could have written that but that's second best today, as I quote Archbishop Tutu. Bless him. Thank you. We want to say thanks once again to the co-sponsors for today's interview, Mondo Weiss, Kairos USA, United Church of Christ, Palestine, Israel Network, Friends of Sabeel, North America, Disciples, Palestine, Israel Network, ICAD USA, United Methodist for Kairos Response, Menopin, Kairos, West Michigan, Episcopal Peace Fellowship, Palestine Israel Network, and Palestine Christian Alliance for Peace. Brian, God bless you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.